Oh. Hey. Paper Mario. As soon as you hear the name of this game, people do one of two things. They think of the first three Paper Marios, or they think of the last two. They never really think of all five, or six. This one doesn't really count as a Paper Mario. It's more of a sorry for sticker star sort of thing. Paper Mario was kind of like that one kid who was doing really cool things at a really young age, and you wanted to see them grow up and do even cooler and bigger things, hoping they wouldn't become the one thing nobody wanted them to be. Then they became that one thing nobody wanted them to be. But I realize that a lot of people don't really know what the series direction is at this point thanks to a certain special inquisitor we all know. So let's go back to a time where Paper Mario was a game people got excited for rather than worried. Paper Mario was the second Mario RPG after Super Mario RPG on the SNES. Originally going to be named Super Mario RPG 2, but was later changed to Paper Mario being the first game in the series lineup. Paper Mario created a new sort of art style, very different from Super Mario RPG. It had a more cartoony and more relaxed environment in terms of design compared to other RPGs at the time. But 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 if we look at all the aspects of Paper Mario, it almost nails everything perfectly on its first attempt at being an RPG made for gamers who aren't, well, the best at playing strategy based games. The writing, the plot, the gameplay, the battle system, oh my god the battle system. They were all executed so perfectly and clearly. The explanations behind them were so nice and easy and whatever happened made sense. You felt like as if you were in control of the game and your character at all times. Like I said before, it was made in a way so people who weren't that great at strategy based games could enjoy it. And this game progressively got more difficult as you played more, but it didn't feel too slow to start either. So let's talk about the story. It starts off with Mario going over to Peach's castle for a party and all these new looking characters are here. And these are just NPCs, but the new designs for these new NPCs are pretty neat and we get into the one and only Bowser's nasty plot. Apparently when Peach wasn't looking, Bowser hid his entire castle under Peach's and made it fly into the air. You know, Bowser must be pretty good at this if nobody noticed him doing this at all. Maybe one day he'll just get a UFO and just cut the castle out of the ground and take it to space. That would be a really weird game. But it would probably be really good. Okay, I'm getting off topic, but Bowser has stolen the Star Rod, which makes him invincible and has imprisoned the seven Star Spirits in seven different locations of the Mushroom Kingdom. Mario needs all seven to fight Bowser because the Star Spirits are the only ones that can fight the invincible power of the Star Rod. Each location is different from the other and requires something new in it, and each star spirit has its own power as well as its personality, which brings a lot of life to the game. And to get around these new environments, we get one of the best inclusions. Partners. In each new chapter, you meet a partner that has an ability to help you on your journey. One has the power of information, one has the power of flight, one has the power of swimming, one has the power of blowing up walls, and it keeps going on and on and on. Just like the star spirits, these partners have their own personality as well as a backstory as to why they want to join you and help you on your journey to stop Bowser. The battle system is turn-based, an interactive RPG I should say while battling. It does give you something to do while you fight, making it feel like you're actually fighting rather than just watching stuff happen. You can level up by collecting star points which are awarded after every battle and after every level up you can increase a stat, HP, FP, or BP. HP is your health, FP are basically points to use more powerful moves, and BP gives you more points to equip badges that can have special effects in and or out of battle. This game did almost everything right, except a few things. The game is definitely a little weird and slow the first time playing it. It can feel a little clunky because of the way the animation looks in battle, and sometimes the objective isn't that clear and it feels like you're just doing chores. It's a good thing I'm a huge enthusiast of shopping list the game, I, I can't even wait anymore, I just really want to start playing this. After a game like that, Nintendo had a lot to live up to. On their first, second if you count all the Mario RPGs, attempt to add a different style to almost everything in the game, they had to keep their new audience interested. And oh my god, did they somehow top their previous game, because look at this! Holy shit! This game is amazing in every way possible. Still to this day, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is my favorite game of all time. The game takes a lot of elements from Paper Mario 64. The art style, but now much crisper. The turn-based battles, except much smoother, faster, and responsive. And added more new elements that we didn't know we wanted, but made the game much more enjoyable. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is a fan favorite amongst many, considered to be the best of all Paper Mario games. Let's get to the specifics. I keep praising it, I don't shut up about it, so why is Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door so damn good? But let me tell you, it starts off as any game would, giving a sense as to what you're going to be working to, but it does something that a lot of games don't do anymore. It gives you what you're working for and how big of a deal it is, but it doesn't give you any details. Wait, that sounds kind of weird, right? It's not easy to do this. 
let it be movies, TV shows, or games. The only thing I know that consistently did this for a long time was Spongebob. Yeah, of all the things I could say, I said Spongebob. What does this even mean though? How can you show how big of an idea something is, but not give any details as to why it's so important, yet understand that it's important? That's exactly why it's so hard. There's a little gray area there that allows for that balance that a lot of games can't do so well. How does Spongebob do this then? It doesn't do it at the same level of intensity as a video game would have, but for each episode, you wouldn't be able to play out the whole story or make any predictions or anything without watching it. Let me give you an example of the episode Wormy. This is the episode Spongebob and Patrick have to take care of Sandy's tree dome while she's in Texas. Now when this episode starts, you watch the first two minutes, could you guess it would go from this to this? No, right? It's crazy how showing the main idea behind something but not providing details immediately instead doing it along the way can help so much in developing a story, which is how developing a story works, but not many people do this anymore and just get straight to the point or drag out unimportant stuff or rush everything at the end. This is what we like to call plot and character development. Once again, not done by many people anymore due to the fact it might be considered cliche. A game, or game series I should say that does this particularly well, is Xenoblade Chronicles. At no point in the game can you completely understand everything in the game until the complete end, and even then, you might be left a little confused. Anyways, getting back to the point of this video, you're probably wondering, what are we even collecting this time? Last game we were collecting the Star Spirits, so what are we going after now? The seven crystal stars. These babies were the coolest things ever. I love just opening up my map and looking how shiny and crisp these things look. Just like the star spirits, they had their own special attack, but they were really memorable. I still remember all the attack names to this day. This whole game felt like a showstopper. <laughs> that was not funny. And there was no point in the game I felt bored. The dialogue was well written, the humor was witty, smartassy, took shots at people, there were dramatic moments, serious moments, emotional moments, tense moments, cinematic moments. This game had everything you wanted. I do remember I didn't like the heavy amount of backtracking as a kid, but playing it again now, I don't even find it that tiring. If I had to say this game had a bad moment, it was just the backtracking, and it took about 10 to 15 minutes tops out of a 28 to 30 hour game just for the main story. They can't make this game better. Can they? They implemented paper mechanics into this game. This creative take on the gameplay made the world that was already huge even bigger. There were four paper abilities. These names I'm about to say are not the official names. I just call it these because they're easy to remember. The paper plane, where you could turn into a paper plane on the paper plane panel and fly over large gaps. The flatten, you can become a flat piece of paper and fit through small cracks. The boat, you could turn into a paper boat and float on water to secret places. And finally, the roll, you could turn into a paper roll and go into small openings and actually increase your speed. This is what set this game apart from the previous installment. It took the original ideas, made them better, made the visuals crisper, gave each of the characters including the NPCs interesting dialogue, there were multiple antagonists, it strayed away from the usual Mario villains but it still made them just as lovable, made the world open yet memorable despite the size and how big each place was. This game had everything that fans of the first Paper Mario wanted, and created a new audience Nintendo was hoping to get out of it as well. Before I finish praising everything in this game, Let's just look at the box art. I remember when I first wanted this game. I saw this game on someone's shelf and looked at how Mario looked. His design was so simple yet charming and the game looked so interesting and different from every other Mario game I had played, which at the time was just Double Dash and Melee. I bought this game and immediately fell in love with it. All the things I listed above and the music and the presentation, it just was done so right. Now that I'm done praising Thousand Year Door in every single direction possible, what happened next? Originally meant to be a GameCube game but switched to the Wii last minute, Super Paper Mario was the third and the last game of Paper Mario's that had a real plot driven based gameplay. And to be fair, this game had the best plot of them all. But Super Paper Mario was really different compared to 64 and the Thousand Year Door, not just because of the different way it handled the visuals, but the entirety of the game itself. It starts similar to the Thousand Year Door with the whole importance of the plot with no details, but this time things look way more serious than the other two games because there's a black hole, a dark wizard, Bowser's army, and Mario dies. The story starts with Peach being kidnapped, but Bowser isn't the culprit, except it's this new guy, Count Black. Bowser, Mario, and Luigi are there to stop him, but Mario gets knocked out, Bowser gets kidnapped along with Peach, and Luigi gets thrown into the void. 
yeah, pretty big mess from the start. If you played Super Paper Mario, you know the story gets intense and really involves you, but the thing that turned a lot of people away was the different style of gameplay. It utilizes the mechanic of switching from 2D to 3D planes, allowing you to see only some things in 2D and others in 3D. It definitely was fun and creative and it was used pretty well. Personally, when I first played this, I didn't like it that much. It felt kind of stale and boring for the first chapter, and after playing the first two Paper Mario games and coming to this where 3D was a feature, it definitely felt kind of weird. The first chapter and the second chapter were definitely slow and they did get better but it had a much slower start compared to the other two. This game we're collecting the pure hearts and yes there are seven of them and Count Black wants to destroy, um, e e existence. Not only that but this game was way more platform based, no turn based battles. You jump on enemies like traditional Mario games but instead you do damage on them but there was no way to know their HP unless you used a Wii Remote and tattled on them. Tattling unlike the other two games wasn't a move but something you did just by pointing the Wii Remote at the screen and identifying the enemy. It was actually pretty handy. Wait but who's doing the tattling? Well instead of partners this time we got pixels. They were partners but just designed a little differently to fit the game aesthetic and to be honest I wasn't really the biggest fan of their design because they were still characters with personalities but it felt weird that you had these random floating things next to you rather than a uniquely designed character. By chapter 3 things start to heat up and the game seems way more fun and the world you're exploring starts to connect together. It definitely is a very different style of Paper Mario but one of those games that does a good job while being different from its predecessors but utilizing elements from them that doesn't make the gameplay quality suffer. However, a game like this can't really be explained that clearly unless you play it. Overall, the world is much more complicated than the other games and the chapters and sub-chapters are also pretty complicated as well. The general plot isn't super easy to understand either, but the experience is one of the best. The art and design direction are amazing and the battle system, while simple at first, does require a bit of strategy to get through. But as you know, all good things must eventually end. It's been four years since we heard about Paper Mario. I don't even know if it exists anymore. Probably just an idea. It's 2011 and Nintendo drops a trailer at E3. Paper Mario is back. The turn-based battles, the items, the different battle menu look. It looks kind of like the old one. There's like some weird stuff in the background that attacks the enemies. That looks interesting and should seem fun and cool, right? <sighs> it wasn't even close to being cool. Paper Mario Sticker Star was a complete mess and disaster compared to the previous three. Like Nintendo had done before in the series, they had a lot to live up to and could have topped their last adventure. But this time, they did the opposite and dropped all our Paper Mario standards for the games after this very low. The story is very simple and not intriguing at all. The sticker comet, which has stickers, has landed in the land of Decalburg. Get it? Because decal, stickers. And all the citizens are gathered to see it. And by all the citizens, I mean toad, 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 and one more, one more, um, um, oh right, toad. There's not a single uniquely designed character in this game except one, and nobody liked her. Anyways, Bowser joins the celebration by touching the sticker comet, making it burst into six royal stickers, and he's basically invincible. Mario tries to do something, gets his ass kicked, and Peach is kidnapped, and that's the story. There are no details on what the royal stickers do, because surprise, surprise, they don't do anything. They don't give you power-ups like the crystal stars or star spirits, they just exist and are causing a problem. So now what? Bowser ruined the sticker fest and the place is a mess, identical toads are everywhere, and you hear a voice. This is where you meet the most annoying character ever. Kirsty. I can't stand this sticky piece of trash. Oh my god. She's so annoying and trying so hard to be funny and sarcastic and just acts like a diva and treats Mario like an idiot. I got this game excited it would be fun, but 10 minutes in, I wanted to return it. Kirsty treats Mario like he hasn't dealt with weird stuff before. This dude has gone through way more than this shiny piece of tape ever has, but let, let, let's just stay on topic. The game is one big chore. The things you do don't contribute to the story which already is very linear. There are some moments that divert away from the story to make it interesting, but other than that, it's just doing menial tasks. The battle system is very flawed because there aren't any experience points, so there's no level ups, FP, BP, nothing. You can avoid every battle, it does not change anything. Okay, forget that, Paper Mario is about paper, right? So maybe there's aspects like turning flat, right? No. 
this game took paper way too seriously. As in, you can get crumpled, paper clipped, taped? What the hell is this, staples? The game is based around the idea of stickers, obviously. And it was a good idea for battle, but there was an aspect that ruined the entire battle system. Thing stickers. Thing stickers are turning real life items you found into stickers and using them in battle for an advantage or using them in the real world with your paperize ability. However, you would never know when to use them or how to use them because there were no hints as to which is the right thing or any button cues at all when you were battling and you just had to guess. In the overworld, if you use the wrong sticker when you paperize, you lose the sticker. And in battle, if you chose wrong, there's no running because they were mainly for boss battles and it's basically game over. WHY DOES EVERYTHING ABOUT YOU SUCK?! There are no chapters, there are worlds now because the game is lazy and isn't really an RPG at this point. There's an excess amount of backtracking and unnecessary work. For example, in World 3 we need to chase down all of Wiggler's segments and there's 5 of them. And we need to chase each one down like twice, so there ends up being like 12 stages in World 3 and none of them are fun. One of the worst parts of this game is the inclusion of Kamek and the role he plays. Kamek is the biggest pain in the ass ever because every time you fight him, he switches your stickers to flip flops and if a sticker is a thing sticker or a rare sticker and you use that flip flop sticker that replaced it, you lose that sticker. That's so <laughs> stupid. None of the mechanics in this game were enjoyable at all. Everything was some sort of troll or joke towards you. Nothing was fun and they all just became some tedious tasks and beating the game doesn't even bring you any satisfaction. The only thing you think of is that you never have to touch this game again. Nothing about this game is good except the music. That's it. I don't remember a single moment I enjoyed this game. No partners, no story, no interesting characters, no jokes, no well-written dialogue, no experience points, no interesting bosses, no objective, no drive. Nothing in this game was good. Except the title theme. That was good. Do you see why I and everyone hates this game now? This game was the beginning of Paper Mario's fall. Lastly, we have our last game for the list of Paper Mario games, Paper Mario Color Splash. Color Splash, in my opinion, was what Sticker Star tried to be. Instead of the idea of stickers, this game used paint, which is already 10 times better. However, the sticker mechanic was still kind of there, but now back in the form of cards. To find hidden areas or people to have the color sucked out of them, you can use the paint hammer and cover them in paint. You can increase your max paint levels as you progress through the story and fighting enemies. This paint hammer power is given to you by the floating paint bucket Huey. Get it? Hue, Huey, color splash. It's a, it's a joke because it's, it's paint. <laughs> Huey, unlike Kirsty, is a nice and actually funny dude, and I love him as a character. You can find cards around the world and levels, and the characters were unique also. They definitely had some interesting art styles to distinguish between enemies, but compared to the original three, the enemy and character variety was still pretty bland. Also, the toads are back! You'd think with all this color, we'd get some different colored toads, right? <laughs> no, they're, they're, they're all still the same. But unlike Sticker Star, each level felt more open and explorable, rather than some job or tedious task to get something done. The world map is really open and well designed honestly, and it definitely feels well put together. So do we have an interesting plot at least this time? Well, it's better than Sticker Star at least. The six big paint stars are missing and Bowser jumped into the fountain where they all reside to gain all the power, but instead got covered in black paint and became possessed. The possessed Bowser, also called Black Bowser, is actually a different mind compared to normal Bowser, normal Bowser doesn't even remember anything that's happened. It honestly was a really cool idea, a possessed Bowser having its own mind using Bowser's body. Of course they could have done way more with it, but that's better than Sticker Star's basic and pointless story. So what exactly is the state of Paper Mario right now? Well, we haven't seen a new game or even any mention of one since 2016, and the largest gap between Paper Mario games has only been 5 years, so maybe we might see one in the near future. But Paper Mario's original formula will never be beaten, and it shows with fans still loving the 64 and Thousand Year Door games, hoping for a port of the Thousand Year Door to the Switch. But who knows what Nintendo will do, they just got a bear and bird duo who were thought to be dead into Smash, and are working on a sequel to quite possibly the best open world game ever made. Well, that's all the time I've got. I gotta get back to taking a dump of my copy of Paper Mario Sticker Star for the Nintendo 3DS. Hey man, I don't really mean to stand in here while you're taking a dump, but don't you need to take your pants off for that? Oh, shit.